Hi, everyone, and welcome to our uh, new webinar series. Just one second, because I have to remove the notifications. I want to focus on you and just on you. Sorry about that. Okay. Let's put this in, in not disturb. Cool. Notifications mute. I'm all yours. So thank you so much for joining. I am Jose Bermejo and I am part of the Predictable Innovations team, uh, the managing partner and the founder. And today's agenda is very quick, 15 minutes webinar, sometimes it's a little bit more, and then 15 minutes of Q&A slash open discussion to answer all your questions and expand all the topics uh, that we've seen in the webinar. So let's get started with a little bit more about us real quick. So we are Breakdown Innovation Strategy, and we are the living heritage of the diffusion of innovations and the technology adoption life cycle. If you are familiar with uh, the Crossing the Chasm frameworks, I don't know, uh, it was a book popularized by Geoffrey Moore. Um, so Warren Schilsinger, our head of the strategy, was the creator of those frameworks, and we've been refining those frameworks across more than 200 consulting projects in tech, some of the projects for Apple, Adobe, Honeywell, um, and other companies in both in Fortune 500 to startups. And basically we help, uh, We our mission is to help crush the inefficiencies of innovation commercialization. So today is about that, right? It's about positioning new B2B products to win. So let's get started with positioning new B2B products to win. How we do that? Well, with our proprietary positioning to market framework. So first we start, the idea uh, is to start by understanding when you are launching a new product to market, how are you positioning the value that you are bringing the, the, to the market, which means understanding what is the value you are, uh, uh, you are driving to the market, to whom you're targeting, how is that value different, or at least uh, uh, position it differently as your competitors. What is the re re what is how is the value relevant for your clients or your prospective clients, your target audience, because it needs to match with their needs, their needs, and the credibility. Why they should trust you, and why are you a credible? Um, a credible player in this market? What is your proof that sustain your decided positioning? Then we move it from positioning to communicating your value. It is not a good positioning if we don't test it in the market, communicate it in the market, and then iterate with feedback from the market to the different layers that build perceptions. We will go through this process. Then it's about how are you selling the value it's building your right sales and distribution channels approach. Then it's about how you are delivering the value through a complete product. And then positioning to market framework is about the last step is how are you amplifying your value reaching the market so that the market knows when to call you, what to call you. But most importantly, they know you at scale. You have... Uh, industry awareness scale, and that is very critical to build a market leadership position. And today we will focus on three steps, which are mostly about positioning, which is how are you positioning your value, how are you communicating your value, and how are you amplifying your reach. Positioning strategy introduction. So the six elements that we will go through today in the are the basics of the positioning to market strategy. It's the targeting, it's your differentiation, your relevancy, your credibility, your reach, and your context. And it's all based on our positioning formula. A winning positioning is relevancy times differentiation times credibility, and all of that is amplified by your reach. And we, I will show you right away uh, each of these steps. So from foundations of a great positioning. When we talk about relevancy, uh, it's about understanding what is critically important to your target customers. Today, there is a lot of buzz around differentiation. And yes, differentiation is one of the key elements of the four key elements for your positioning strategy, but it's not the only one. Plenty of times I came across clients that they say, 
I am different because of this and this and this, but their differentiators, they cannot prove them. So they are not credible and they are not relevant, which means they doesn't match client needs. So differentiation, credibility, which means everything you say and how are you different should match with your competitive strengths or what we call your crown jewels. And the best way to build your positioning strategy is in the intersection of these three different worlds. Competitor white spaces, which is how are you different? Company crown jewels or your competitive strength, which is your credibility. And critically important, what is critically important for your target customers or their needs, which is, is it relevant for your clients? And of course, everything must be aligned with the market category context. Why? Because your innovation, remember that this is about launching new products to the market, positioning new B2B products to win, your differentiation basis shifts and your positioning shifts depending if you are creating a new category or you are not. So this is the bell curve, the technology adoption life cycle. On the left, early adopters and innovators are what we call early markets. If you are introducing a novel innovation that is competing with an existing behavior, not competing with an existing product in the marketplace, uh, and you are you know, challenging the status quo somehow, you are making people learn something new and changing the way they are behaving or they need they have to learn something new, you are creating a new category. That means you're creating a new market. So the way you enter here for that, you start with horizontal positioning because early adopters, they don't care much about uh, you know, a specificity on a segment or application. But now what you really want is to win in the mainstream market because early adopters and innovation, innovators are just 16% of any given market. So that means that either if you have uh, entering and creating a new market or not, you want to move forward and to win the big piece of a mainstream, either the early majority or the late majority. And in this case, when you are entering an existing category with our refining with our refinement of a product, let's say that you are changing you know, the definition of a CRM you are launching a new CRM. CRM meets is in more than 95% of adoption in that category. Uh, so if you're launching a new CRM, you need to be very specific on the segment and the application that you can win because these people here cares about that. And it's the only way to make you different from existing market leaders. So first thing is market context. It's understanding where are you entering the category in your innovation. What kind of innovation are bringing you to the market so that you can position it the right way? Are you refining a refinement of an existing product or are you creating a new category? And then why is this important also? Because depending on where are you entering, different adopters, they care about different positioning messages. You can take a screenshot of this and take it you know, home because these are the kind of messages that 30 years of observations told us that they care. That's why your positioning messages should, uh, uh, let's say, should, should evolve as your market matures. And plenty of times we see novel innovations that are launched. We see plenty of startups that, you know, they became scale-ups, they are growing. The category enters into the mainstream and they don't update their positioning messages. And then they struggle to grow in the mainstream. And it's because basically because they are running out of alignment with their market. So basically, early adopters, innovators, they care about technology. Early adopters, they care about your product. Early majority, your product and the, the advantage your product gives to them. Early majority, the first chunk of the mainstream adopters, they care about market messages. And the majority, they care about organization messages, including branding. So yeah, this is another hot take today. Branding, when branding matters, well, branding matters when you are approaching the mainstream because early adopters, they don't care much about your brand or your start with why and all of that. Early adopters just, just care about the advantage your product provides. So uh, yeah, brand strategy is important for the mainstream. So don't waste time if you are in an early market or if you are launching a new product at the very beginning of market. <laughs>
What is the winning positioning? First of all, your company has a strong viewpoint that captures the attention of the market. Positioning is not your messages. Positioning doesn't exist in your messages. Positioning exists in the perception of your market. So what is the positioning that your market thinks you have? That is positioning. It's a mental game. The market knows where to call you and when. Then your market aligns with your positioning and differentiators. You have market alignment. Everyone in your company is on the same page. Plenty of times we see a lot of in-house disalignment, internal alignment. Sales engage at the executive or decision-making level. Your close rate of sales qualified leads is at least 20%. Your solution commands a premium price. As sales don't complain about pricing, there is buyer urgency. Your solution is a got-to-have solution. And analysts and customers are adopting your language and publishing you. But how do we do this? How do we build the strategy here. Okay, let's go to how to implement these two tactics. As I said, positioning starts by understanding existing perceptions. So the closer your positioning and your messages are to current market perceptions, the better, because the market will trust you. It's credible. So market alignment strategy is mostly about understanding your market perspective. And the process is about First, understanding what is your perspective and assessing your perspective. And then you go out there, which is this small circle, because we don't know much. You don't know much, as much as you think you know about your market. Your market knows more and knows better. And that's the first step to success. So then you go out to your market and then you assess your market. And you build your positioning in the intersection of both, but mostly on what the market believes trusts and would accept. Now, assessing the market. This is the market infrastructure framework. This is one of our creep frameworks. And this is the way we see the markets. This is one of the frameworks that Steve Jobs used uh, with the help of Regis Makina. Uh, our team was there. Uh, Warren was, was there uh, helping with this. So. We see the market as a different group of players influencing each other. In the very bottom is you and your product and the innovation that you want to launch in the market. And in the very top are your prospective customers. And in the middle, there are all these different layers, organizations, individuals influencing each other and generating market perceptions. Through word of mouth, they are going to talk about you, about your positioning, about your differentiation, about the needs that you're solving about your product. And they can either hurt you and they can either support you or they can just be indifferent, right? You want the support part. That's when you can build a market leadership position. That's what you want. That's what you want for your product introduction. So in order to get their support, in order to build a strong market driving strategy, we need to understand their perspectives. So the point is, to go to three to five of each of these players, partners and allies, complementary suppliers in your supply chain, industry associations, educational institutions, industry analysts, research firms, floor leaders, interview three to five in each of those layers. Potentially, and best scenario, they will be the top 10% most well-known players in each layer. They are going to give you perspectives about why your solution can help or not, what could be market objections, what they would trust or support your eventual launch and your positioning. And with that is when you can build a strong positioning to market strategy. So you go out there and you assess them. Here you have recent examples of luminary engagement because it's, okay, how do I outreach them? Well, here you can just, um, you can just take those, those examples. Uh, uh, now, this is a market infrastructure example. And in this market infrastructure example is for um, an incident management platform. So here in the incident management platform, we have different layers represented by different players, right? And in this case, we will outreach them, we will talk to them, and we would find the position into market strategy. What do we want to find? We want to find partners when we are interviewing them. Tools you can use, Fathom, 
video, which is a recording tool, and Dovetail to tag all the different transcripts of these tools. These tools are going to transcribe for you. And you want to uh, create groups of tags uh, for target customer analysis, customer motivation, channels, pricing, complete product definition, partner analysis, next target, positioning and messages, and competitive analysis. And competition, right? So once you have all those tags and once you have all those patterns, is when at the same time you can describe the different opportunities that they are telling you that your product or idea can solve, right? So you describe your opportunities by describing the decision-making unit, the problem statement and motivations, the job to be done you're solving, the outcomes, and so on. The current scenario that they have now, what they have tried, what are the pain points, and the decided the scenario. So describe all the opportunities that you can win, and that is the key, win. Where can you be, let's say, a market leader, or when do you have a true opportunity to win these markets? And then you score those opportunities. And you score those opportunities by following an opportunity scoring matrix. And basically, this opportunity scoring matrix lays at the intersection of is your product easy to buy, is your product easy to sell, and how are you effectively organized to sell this product and to drive market trust. So here is an example of a recent project we've done. The first criteria for the scoring is does your buyer has an, an urgent problem to solve and your product fits with that urgent pro uh, problem to solve? Well, how, how urgent is for them to solve that problem? Then do they have a compelling reason to buy? The next one is, are they accessible through the existing channels? Maybe we found a segment or an application that we don't have the channels developed. We have other channels that we can easily access, right? Are there new solutions expected in the marketplace? And how fast, how simple is the buying decision process? Are you credible to sell in this category or this product because you have strengths and differentiators? And do you provide a complete solution, not a product, but a complete solution that fits with what they want? Once you have these priorities is when you know the order of attack. Because here the key is to win. You want to win segment after segment. And that's the way you penetrate in the market, right? Unless you are the absolute leader. Uh, if you are the absolute leader, well, that, that's, that's, a, that's another discussion. But if you are not, or you're introducing a new product, you want to know where you can win first. Because once you win and you can claim a market leadership positioning of a segment or an application, then you can grow easily with more credibility to what we call adjacent segments, okay? Sarah, yeah, let me, Sarah, I know you're connected. Sorry about that. I'm taking a lot of time. It's the first time that I do this supposedly micro webinar. I just hope that you have time. Do you have time? Because there are still more slides to go. Uh, you, can, you can drop a message in the chat. Okay, cool, Sarah. Thank you so much. So I will move forward. And please drop questions. If you have questions as I'm talking, drop your questions and then I will read your questions and move forward during the Q&A. Now, the next step is, well, more than the next step is, the key here is we are assessing the market by talking with all the market infrastructure. And your market infrastructure is unique. This is just an example. First step is to understand who is your market infrastructure. Then outreach them, talk to them, ask the questions, and find those patterns. And with those patterns, you describe the opportunities and score the opportunities and prioritize the opportunities. Now, as you are scoring and prioritizing the opportunities, so far we've been talking about positioning. We've been talking about how are you positioning your value, targeting, differentiation, relevancy, and credibility. But there are other parts of your positioning to market process that these guys, your market assessment, are going to help you with plenty of insights. So as you are assessing, you are going to understand what should be your selling approach. Because you are going to understand is your, if your product is very difficult to sell, is a high ticket, is highly disruptive, well, you probably need a consulting selling approach 
is your product is not a plug and play for the market in the market perspective you probably need a consulting selling approach and it's not just about you know a guy that knows how to sell this transactionally probably you need a team you need a sales engineer you need a sales person and so on and this approach of uh, talking with the infrastructure and assessing the market is going to tell you this step also. It's going to tell you also in terms of how you complete the, the how you deliver the value. How you deliver the value means not just the core features that you have. Maybe you're getting right your core features, but your market is going to get back to you with objections. For example, we were in a bit business engagement for a new artificial intelligence product in the sales tech space. So they were unveiling potential relationships to sell more in a, in a company. So they were telling says people who can introduce whom through work relationships. And then uh, who can potentially be a good champion because uh, he has a really good network inside the company. So with artificial intelligence, they were recommending how to drive change management inside a company, how to drive more sales and so on, right? But most of the times it's not just about the features. When we approach the market and the market matures, the mainstream 68% of any given market, they care about low risk and they care about low disruption in their workflows. So that's what we call complete product. Complete product means that how are you uh, delivering that value? Are you providing training services so that your product fits better with what they need to learn, fits better with their workflow? Are you providing integrations to fit better with their current tech stack? Are you providing support? What kind of support? Is your technology widely supported worldwide? Are you providing references so that they feel safer with you? That's what we call the complete product, right? Are you providing safety mechanisms? Like, for example, if you are managing critical data, what are your safety mechanisms? Are your safety mechanisms adhered to industry safety standards? All of that are not core features, but are the most important uh, drivers of a buying decision in a ministry, not in an early market, in a ministry. And that's what we call complete product. How are you delivering the value, the complete product? And then the last step is how are you amplifying your value reach? So far, we've talked, and this webinar is about how are you positioning your value? But going out to the market and talking with your infrastructure with this kind of assessment is going to give you information about the full positioning to market process. Now, next step, communicating your value. Sorry. We are here in the green one, which means messaging equals a communicate in our framework, in our method. Now is when after you get all those patterns and when you build, you understand who should you target first and why should you target first is when you build a positioning statement, which is your decided position. That doesn't mean that is the position you have right now. You are launching a product. Is how do you want the market to see you. So who is your target audience? What is your market category of product? Maybe if you are creating a category, the category still doesn't exist. So you can attempt to claim a category creation, uh, but most of the times it's not on you. You can call the category whatever you want, but at the end of the day, as the market matures, the analysts, the thought leaders, that pyramid is going to name the category on your behalf. But if you are a category creator and you are the first mover, which means you have first mover advantage, you have an advantage because you can be seen as the category creator. What it does, what your product does, and what problem you solve. The benefits or the outcomes, which means economic rewards, or not economic, but rewards at the end of the day, the outcomes, so they can do something better, your target audience, and the key differentiators. And depending on your market maturity, on how are you entering the market, are you entering in new markets or in an existing mature market, your key differentiators should be different. As said, early markets, your key differentiators should move around providing an advantage, your core features and your technology, your product. Differentiators in more mature markets should be around your company track record, your logos, your market wins. How are you providing value to 
a given segment, and so on. And then you build your positioning platform. I don't want to go through all of this, but basically it's a little bit more extended than the positioning statement. We're extending it in a way that provides your value proposition. How do you do it? Objections handling messaging. Why you issued answers? Why now? What is the sense of urgency? And why should they trust you? Right. And then this is the critical part. It doesn't matter what you say about you. The market positions you. So you need to activate your position. So this is the last step, which is amplifying your reach. And this is critical also for product launch. So what we recommend is you have your key positioning messages, you have your positioning platform, you know who to target and you have a product all together when you are here. You have your communication strategy, which means your messages. Now, and your messages should drive differentiation, should drive credibility, and should be relevant, right? The three circles. Now, those messages you want to get back to your market infrastructure and share with them those messages in a demo, in a worksheet, in a white paper, wherever the content it is that they like to consume in a video, you filter to them the positioning messages and you try to get your su their support. That's your launch sequence. So you build your launch sequence from bottom to top. You first introduce your clients. When your clients, you get your first early adopters, you have proof of value. You have delivered value to them. You get the use cases and testimonials. And with those use cases and testimonials, you go to partner analyze. You get the support of partner analyze. You get a testimonial, maybe a video of a partner ally. You go to complementary supplier. And you build credibility as you go up and up and up. And you are sending those positioning messages across all these layers so that they are positioning your product on your behalf because they are actually the ones positioning technologies in the marketplace. So that's how you launch a product. Basically, a launch equals to a positioning activation exercise, right? So when you reach, for example, industrialists, you don't want to go to an industrialist and say, hey, you know, I got this new idea. When you don't get me into the market, into the Gardner Magic Quadrant, that's not how it works, right? So you need to tell the industrialists, you know, all these consultants are using it. And I have videos or testimonials of the consultants working with their clients, supporting us. This industry association, they are using it widely. We have these partners analyzed, we have these logos, we have these use cases, we have this demonstrated proof of ROI, return on investment, right? And then is when eventually you get industrialists at Garner, at Forrester, so on, talking about you, right? Uh, at least what you want to achieve in a launch process is having a pre-briefing round with your industrialists. And the last step, and this is the last, absolutely last step, is the press release. Quite basically, you got to go layer by layer, bottom to top, because that's how you educate the market. You don't want to reach your prospective customers without all this proof and messages communicated through the infrastructure. Otherwise, you're going to seem like very low credible source, right? So you want, when you reach your prospective customers, they are going to ask industry associations, consultants they know, industrialists, they are going to research about you. So when they, you reach this layer with the press release, you want to already have all this proof field on relationships. So that's your launch. This is just a way that you know we introduce a technology by following this. And that was it, that, that's a wrap. I just want to share with you that we have a cohort-based course and I'm going to share with you the URL of the cohort-based course. We are scouting the market and Warren, of course, the creator of all these frameworks, uh, he would be one of the main instructors together with me. And we will teach you all uh, of these frameworks, not only teach, but you will get out uh, of, of that cohort based course with your positioning to market strategy. Uh, Sara, I am listening to you. What do you think? Do you have questions? Let me real quick share with you if you want to get into the wait list of the cohort-based course, which I would love to. Uh-huh, the main experts. 
Maybe I can invite you to talk because we are just the two of us. All right, there we go. Can you hear me? Cool. Nice. Hello. Thanks for, uh, thanks for Nora. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, yeah. Nice little small session. It's great to ask uh, good questions. Um, and uh, my my previous career was building out mostly cohort based learning. So a big fan of cohort uh, based learning methods, and um, oh, you know cool. it's a good way to really uh, do a lot of applied work and you know ask really targeted one on one questions. Um, and I had uh, been talking uh, to my I'm blanking on his name, so Michael. Uh, who had referred me to the webinar, um, and he had uh, your, no, uh, shoot, who is your coworker that I'm thinking of? Not Michael. I was just talking to Michael. That's why it's in my head. My coworker or your Nicholas. coworker? Nicholas. 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 Ah, okay. Yes. Um, sorry. I was like, you know, sometimes your brain's like, I'm going to say this word, and I know it's not right. It was doing one of those things. I was talking to Nicholas, and he had like previously talked about this, and I thought, oh, it's a Maven course. I have a Maven course too. Um, it hasn't read. Oh, you while. have. You have yeah, one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, with me. yeah. No. So I'm I'm definitely familiar uh, with Maven, like Maven. I think it's a, a good platform. Um, the yeah, the part that really intrigued me when I was talking to Nicholas was uh, around this idea of like thought leadership. Because as they put in the chat, both my both my co-founder and I like have been in the knowledge sharing space, like basically like the work that we do in cohorts. It's like, how do you transfer knowledge as efficiently as possible from a teacher to students? And then so mm -hmm. how do you apply that to workforce? And then we, you know, certainly don't have so much hubris that we think we have all the answers. We go to research faculty who have done lots of research on companies that have done this well versus companies that have done this inefficiently. So we have like other thought leaders who can like back this up as to why it's important and how it connects to ROI. What I'm curious about, and it might be something you talk about in your course, but um, just I'm thinking kind of like off the dome, if you're aware of any kind of public study information around this is, have you ever seen that done well by like another brand new company that came off as like authentic of like, these are the right people here to solve the problem. And they brought a team of other people supporting them. Uh, and you should kind of trust them out of the gate versus this idea of like, I'm here to peddle a product and get you to buy it. And so I'm inherently coming off as like, you should trust my ways. It'll help me with sales. Like, do you see kind of the disconnect where one is a little bit more of a genuine, we did our work, we started this company because we saw the gap and we know how to fix it the correct way versus I'm going to push a different solution to you and you should believe me uh, because I want my sales to go up. Yeah. Yeah. That That's the part that this framework, the pyramid, mm -hmm. that framework solves and talking with the market infrastructure solves. Because if you remember, there was a slide in which internal perspective, which is what you mean by I'm pushing this solution mm -hmm. and the market perspective. And the market perspective is basically the perspective of that infrastructure, right? So what you want to do, and, and, and yes, we've seen, we've seen players applying that very, uh, in a very right way. And basically one of the big success was, you know, Apple in the early 90s when Regis McKenna helped them. Basically, Steve Jobs, before launching Apple products, they wired the market for success by following this pyramid. That's what Steve Jobs was, was doing, is making sure that people is going to support my technology. But you don't do that pushing. On the other side, you do that listening and asking questions. Mm -hmm. So when we do that for our clients, we first do that internal perspective. And we ask the questions like, who do you think, what do you think are your differentiators? And you have your perspective, which is you are creating an innovation and you want to drive acceptance in the market for that innovation so that you sell more and you change things and so on. But your perspective is not, not always wide enough to get the support of the market. So that's how you overcome the sales push versus the market pull. You go to the infrastructure and you ask them, hey, 
you know, we're bringing the market this innovation and we believe this innovation is going to help in this way, in this way, in this way. What do you think? Give me feedback. What, are the, what other players are there? What are the barriers of success that in your experience you see for this innovation? And they are coming up with absolute gold. They're coming up with plenty of what we call adoption objections, which mm -hmm. means objections for the market to support you. So if you have that pyramid not supporting you, is when you have to do your approach, the approach you are telling, which is I'm doing push. Yeah. That's that's not the right positioning. You're not positioning correctly and you are not amplifying your reach correctly. So it's yeah. the other way we want to do. And this approach shows that. So you want to go to the infrastructure, get them on board. But for that, you have to be open to listen. And that means get their feedback. For example, we had a consulting, uh, and I remember this, with this B2B SaaS uh, in the sales tech space, the same I was uh, talking. And it was an inter in the, uh, artificial intelligence engine. And we were talking with the experts, mostly consultants, this consulting layer, they were asking to us, okay, let's say that uh, I have to support this new technology and they were organizational development consultants, experts in you know psychology, experts in leadership and so on. And they were seeing a good opportunity for this kind of artificial intelligence engine to, uh, to, to, for diversity and inclusion, to drive changes in diversity and inclusion. But their first concern was, how do I know that your data is not biased? Because if I am building my consulting business or I'm supporting your tool and your data is biased, it might actually prevent diversity and inclusion. Because if your data is all built on top of white males, we're not mm -hmm. solving the problem. That's something that the guys building didn't see coming. So you want to solve that before you launch. That's when the market is going to pull and you don't have to push. You don't have to convince anyone. You're listening yeah. to them. You get them on board. You fix product and you fix messages. It takes longer the launch stage. That's why <laughs> most of the times is is a complete management expectation. I would say trip when someone hires to us. They hire to us. They hire to us for this launch for process. This launch process. And then we go. Then we go no, you get to stop your press release. You don't have the support of the layers. We don't even know yeah. if they want to support you or not. You don't even have updated features and positioning messages that that fits with market objections to overcome all of that. You want to build that. So when you launch the press release, all of them are talking about your press release. And that's what drives pull, right? Yeah. I don't know if and that I, answers your question. No, it does. And like, um, I guess like I'll add a layer of clarification is like, yes, bottom of the pyramid, talking to customers, basically having your customers like tell you the language you should be using of why they love your product, like completely like understand the value of uh, product language fit. I think like the, the root of my question really comes in a very like specific way where it's like, I think we've done intense like customer discovery and right now we're rolling out early product and trying to figure out workflows and all of that, like create the least amount of friction, provide the maximum amount of value. Um, and we can get it with like kind of our core ICP. And I understand that like going after kind of that core ICP is important, saturate that market before you go for everyone. But like the thought leadership around it, like there's kind of this like disconnect um, that I, I think we hear a lot. And this is why like this thought kind of is in my head. And it's this idea of like we're launching to smaller teams, smaller teams understand so much more how important knowledge, efficient knowledge sharing is. They want to basically build good systems from the ground up. They want to move fast. They don't have time for bulky process. Like basically their systems are fresher. So if you like interject a product that's like, we just like supercharge your processes, they're like, great, sign me up. But then when you like start to level up to like that downstream market, that enterprise target who might be our, our long-term ICP, they're kind of stuck in this like, well, the system's super broken and like your ways are effectively like, we, we just like can't, we got so used to our bad tools that we can't wrap our heads around like a different way. So I think that's like where we get stuck on like, how do you confidently project a message 
with one type of ICP backing you, that obviously is important, but then project thought leadership in a way that makes all those people who are so used to their broken tools go, okay, hold on, hold on. They might be onto something. That's, that's what I mean. Mm. Yeah, I understand. So what you want to do is, uh, is your product early, meaning that you are focusing on ICP and doing the bowling pin strategy, trying to develop the market? Yeah, exactly. So like our launch okay. customer are uh, companies that are 31 to 200 employees that are going through like these scalable hiring processes where like knowledge transfer starts to break down. Mm -hmm. And then once we nail that market going from like 200 to 1000 employees, and obviously these markets are pretty big by themselves, um, you know, tackling like bigger knowledge debt with the goal of hitting enterprise organizations where the systems are completely broken, but we will have already figured out kind of the human behaviors that like drive that change in very natural ways. So we can just kind of walk in and say, we've already vetted the difficult part, which is getting people to use this. We've already guaranteed that like users like this, this is easy, this is a slam dunk, this is, it works with your existing systems. There's not a whole lot like, like hopefully we will be there, but you're dealing with like kind of a, a skeptical, much more skeptical buyer. That's just mm -hmm. like, I've heard before that productivity is important, but like we bought these tools and they, nobody used them and it didn't work. Um, but it, and it also, um, and unfortunately, like we're getting a little downwind of the tech layoffs. People have this like notion that if someone doesn't do good work, they're a bad employee and they should be laid off when we're kind of exposing this idea of like, no, they haven't been given the tools to be successful. Well, it gives them the tools to be successful. So you actually get a more complete picture of who mm -hmm. your best employees are. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. So basically when you are, when, when you are uh, in this stage, like you mm -hmm. are, you have different so different segments, enterprises are different from uh, these smaller companies that you are targeting right now. Mm -hmm. So what you want to do is gain the market leadership with the smaller companies and mm -hmm. get the infrastructure uh, backing you. And, and yes, you start building thought leadership pieces, talking around the problems and the pains that you are solving for those guys, because those are the guys that you want to win. Sometimes what happened, I mean, if you are super big, super big, and you have plenty of resources, it's okay to diversify. Mm -hmm. But it's not the best strategy because when you diversify, you are also opening the window for the competition to get your... Something happened. Bench head. Yeah, something happened here. Oh, okay, you're back. No. Yeah, so you don't want to open. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they disabled the video for you. I don't know why. And well, I have to jump in in a couple of minutes. Yep. That's fine. Because yeah. I have another meeting. But basically, you want to first win your batch head pin segment because that is what's going to drive your credibility and a thought leadership position and enough success cases for the more skeptical mm -hmm. mainstream. And if enterprise is more skeptical, they are going to ask. Basically, skeptical means that they want to reduce more the risk perception. Mm -hmm. So you need other kind of what we call intangibles around your product. And it's more about uh, building super services, training services for them. It's about providing success cases. It's about providing testimonials for the, from the infrastructure, getting the infrastructure backing you that reduced dramatically the risk perception. So that is why it's super important that you do all of that to win the first segment, the first bench had been, and then you move into the more skeptical. Yeah. Okay. What happened is that a lot of times, because businesses see a bigger opportunity in enterprise, they try to move too quickly into the enterprise without a sustained position, without a credible position. And yeah. that's not going to work because that people is very skeptical. They are going to ask around about you. And if that infrastructure is not well informed about you, there is no way you're going to sell because they are more skeptical. They want to avoid risk. They want to hire IBM yeah. to avoid being fired, right? Yeah. So, so the way to avoid that is complete your product with what we call intangibles, support, training, all of that and get the infrastructure backing you 
-hmm. and you once you have proof of market leadership for that segment that you can say we have 200,000 customers i don't know what is your market uh, how big is your market but it's just just saying right you can say that you have a big chunk of your market share you can you can claim that is when you want to attack the next segment yeah yep. because you have a really credible and a strong position yeah yeah okay market yeah, no, that, that, that's helpful. And uh, my husband always works on the company. He's a growth marketer. He's done a lot of go to market. And he always says something very similar. Of, like you have to be a product that like somebody loves first before you can be a product that everyone even knows you exist. Um, because if you try and go after too many, like you're just you're, you're shooting yourself in the face because you're just uh, you're a product for no one at that point. Um, but yeah, it's just you said to everyone, you said to no one. Yeah, exactly. So um, awesome. Well, this is great. I will, I'll add my name to your wait list. Uh, and uh, oh, would you love to join? That would be great. Uh, yeah, let me let me just make sure again, it works with timing, it works with budget, we're raising all that good stuff. Um, but like, I will add my okay. name to the list. And if it fits, uh, you know, it's always a really good exercise for us. And uh, like I said, big fan of cohort based learning. Um, and yeah, happy to, to chat. That would there. be great. Okay, yeah. so once you add it to the to the to the waitlist, I will send you updates on the syllabus. We're building the syllabus. We're and me. Uh, we are we are building the dates. Potentially, it's coming by, by April. Those mm -hmm. are the first days that we're managing. It's going to be two weeks, six sessions of ninety minutes live, two sessions optional. So all mm -hmm. of this is going to be in four sessions plus two Q and A optional sessions with Warren and me, and with the templates. So that after the four sessions, you you take your you know, your work. And the, the next step, the next natural step would be go out to the infrastructure yeah. and ask because everything you build on the course is built on your perspective, not the market, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's, but yeah, we work on that during the conference. And, and that's good timing for us because essentially we're doing like lead up to go to market in April with go to market in May. So that would oh, work. Oh, fantastic. Out. Fantastic. Cost on the, the course too. I mean, like we're raising, so if we close everything, it should be fine, but just uh, cost per seat. Yeah, it's going to be 500. And if oh. you are open to provide us, us feedback, it's going, uh, I will send you a 20% discount. Feedback in terms of, you know, a call, one hour of call. So you, you give us feedback if we're doing well before the course, if the course syllabus is okay for you, so we can adapt. I mean, you are our early adopters. And then, you know, for next cohorts, the price will go up until eventually it reaches 1500. So I would say it's a good deal now that we are launching it. <laughs> yes, and like I, if I can be of any help as a person who's built a lot of cohort-based uh, learning, if I, I'm uh, sure I'm happy to give you feedback. Up Thank you so up. much. And I, I have a lot it. to learn. Yeah, I have a lot it, to learn about education. If you nail it, it's like the best way to deliver this type of content. The fact you're already like working in frameworks and whatever, it's just like it's a matter of really understanding that balance of how you use live sessions effectively, how you. But like I'm, I'm happy to talk to you about that because I always you. want people to deliver the best possible courses possible. I may need your help. I may need your help. I, I okay. went through the Maven course, oh, and uh, yeah, yeah. And it was very exciting. But still, you know, uh, I'm still learning. Well, I will, I'll, I'll put my name on there. Let's chat. You, uh, I think your, your price point's great. And I'm happy to help out uh, design the best possible experience. Thank you so much, Sarah. I really appreciate it. Let's get in okay. touch. Let's continue. Right. This. Okay. Thank Take you. Care. Bye. Bye.